Unity is an extremely popular, if not the most popular, cross-platform 2D and 3D game engine. It's the powerhouse behind massive titles like Rust, Escape from Tarkov, Call of Duty Mobile, and even Among Us, which is pretty sus. The engine has been around for nearly two decades, and when it first came out, it practically revolutionized the gaming industry. Unity equips both artists and developers with a robust set of tools, allowing them to focus on making an enjoyable game that runs on many platforms. Gone are the days of requiring a computer science degree just to make a video game from scratch. With all of these good things being said, I want to mention my favorite part about the Unity game engine. The fact that these games are terribly easy to hack. The things that make Unity great are also the engine's downfall in terms of cheaters. Join me today as we take a quick tour of the Unity game engine before we dive into the many ways to cheat in these games. Whether you're a developer or just someone who enjoys breaking games, this should be interesting, so be sure to stick around. When it comes to making video games, or even hacking them, there is a certain amount of programming knowledge required. I know when I was getting started, I really struggled to wrap my head around many of the core concepts, but that's exactly why this video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online platform where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and even AI. Personally, I love Brilliant because they take a unique approach to learning. Instead of reading walls of text or having to listen to boring lectures, their lessons are full with hands-on problem solving, allowing you to develop an understanding of complex topics from the ground up. If you don't believe me, I highly recommend that you take a look at their Programming with Python course. Here, you'll get familiar with Python and begin building programs from day one with an interactive built-in drag and drop editor. You'll even begin learning about core concepts like loops and functions in their signature interactive fashion. So what are you waiting for? To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash CAS or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the video. Here we are looking at a brand new 3D scene in the Unity editor. A scene is simply a collection of game objects, which begs the question, what's a game object? Well, if we take a look at the hierarchy window to the right, we find three items inside of our so-called sample scene, a main camera, a directional light, and a global volume. These three things are, in fact, game objects. Realistically, anything you can put into a scene is a game object. So let's make this a bit more interesting by adding a simple cube. We do this by right-clicking in the hierarchy view, selecting 3D object, and then cube. Immediately, we notice that a cube has been added to our scene. You can click and drag on this cube to move it around, but more importantly, the window to our left, known as the inspector, has suddenly been populated with values. The inspector window shows the so-called components of the game object that you have selected. Components are like building blocks. They are properties and behaviors that belong to the game object. There are hundreds of components to choose from, and by applying different components to different objects, we can create complex behaviors behaviors and ultimately fully functional games. The transform component is a very special one because every single game object in Unity has to have one. Transform describes an object's position, rotation, and scale within a scene. With my cube selected, if I start messing around with the position fields, you'll notice the cube move around in the scene. This is cool and all, but right now our cube does nothing. Let's say we wanted to make our cube move when the player presses WASD. Well, we can do that by attaching a script to the cube. Scripts allow us to modify the properties of the components programmatically with code, specifically c -sharp code, which is a joy to work with. To add a script to our cube, make sure it's selected and then hit the Add Component button at the bottom of the inspector. The component will be of type New Script. Go ahead and click that. We'll be naming our script cube move, and then you can simply click the create and add button. You'll now notice that our cube has a new component, that being the cube move script that we just created, but right now it does absolutely nothing. At the bottom of our screen, within the project tab, you'll notice that a new file has been added. Specifically, this file has a little script icon along with the name cube move. I'm going to double click this file to open it up in my favorite editor, Visual Studio Code. Once open, we notice a simple class called cube move, which inherits from mono behavior. The class also has two empty methods, namely start and update. Reading the comments above each of these methods gives us a hint as to what they do. The start method is called once, before the first frame update, whereas the update method is called constantly, every single frame of the game. These are fixed Unity events. Basically, we never have to call these methods. Instead, Unity will call them for us. To move our cube, we're going to be working within the update method, so we can go ahead and remove the start method entirely. Within update, the first thing we want to do is access 
this Unity's input system to determine what the player is trying to do. We'll create a local variable called move input, which will be a 3D vector storing the direction in which the player wants to move. By using input.getAxis with the parameters horizontal and vertical, we have a universal way of getting the player's movement direction. This will work with WASDA and arrow keys alike. Next, all we need to do is update the position field of the transform component of the cube. We do that by multiplying the move input by a constant speed, in our case 30, and then multiplying that by delta time, which is a topic for a later video. Make sure to use the plus equal sign to add the movement onto the current position, and voila, we should now be able to move our cube. Back in the editor, if we click the play button at the top, the game should run, and when you click W or S, the cube should move up and down. When you click A or D, the cube should also move left and right. Of course, the cube can't move forward or backwards right now because we set Z to zero. I hope this gives you a basic understanding of how Unity games work. We create scenes which contain game objects. We then add components to the game objects to make them do things within the scenes. Large games use these exact same concepts, just at a much larger scale to do much more complex things. We cannot talk about hacking Unity games without mentioning the various runtimes that Unity games can be exported with. Obviously, Unity is a cross-platform game engine, and therefore, to run your game on different platforms, we need programs and libraries installed on said platforms that understand how to run the game. Because Windows holds the largest desktop gaming market share, we'll mainly be focusing on Windows, but these concepts will still apply to the other platforms as well. Unity games for Windows can be exported in one of two ways, either through the Mono runtime, or through a special procedure known as IL2CPP. Mono is a popular open source runtime that essentially starts a virtual machine and runs the game in there. This is similar to how Java applications run in the Java virtual machine. Specifically, it uses something called just-in-time or JIT compilation, allowing it to execute faster than programs that are not compiled at all, like a Python script for example. Essentially, when you run your game with Mono, the game has been compiled into something called Common Intermediate Language, or CIL for short. Mono can understand CIL, so when you run your game, Mono starts its virtual machine and runs the semi-compiled code in there, allowing you to play said game. Mono is generally used for small to medium games, as it is simple, easier to run on other platforms, but not the most efficient. In terms of hacking, Mono games are the easiest to hack because the process of compiling to CIL is very easily reversed, basically allowing us to get the game's entire source code with just the click of a button. This is very different to games that are coded in C or C++, because the compilation process involved with those languages is not reversible. Instead, we are left with a binary file that can only be represented as assembly code. Yes, there are so-called decompilers, but these only produce pseudocode, which is effectively a guess as to what the assembly does. Not to mention that all the information like class names, function names, and variable names are completely lost when compiling a C or C++ program. This takes us to the special procedure that I mentioned earlier. The other way to export Unity games for Windows is through IL2CPP. IL2CPP is an acronym for Intermediate Language to C++. Basically, the game's c -sharp code is compiled into CIL just like before, but instead of running this code in a virtual machine like Mono, there's an extra step of converting the Intermediate Language directly into C++ and then compiling it. This outputs a native system binary, which will be platform specific, but there are two benefits for game developers when doing this. The first benefit is that the code runs considerably faster because it is native to the system. And the second benefit is that by virtue of the IL2CPP process, it makes the game slightly more difficult to hack. Unity game developers with more than three brain cells are obviously aware that their games are easy to take apart. So there are a few countermeasures that developers employ to make hackers' lives a bit more difficult. I've already partially mentioned one of these techniques. Earlier when I was talking about IL2CPP, I said that one of the benefits of using it is the fact that it makes the life of a hacker slightly more difficult. This is because the procedure partially obfuscates the game's code. Unfortunately for game developers though, IL2CPP also exports a shit ton of metadata with the game which can be used to unobfuscate the code. This brings us to the first form of protection that game developers use, code obfuscation, specifically name mangling. When c -sharp is compiled into CIL, an uncomfortable amount of data about the source code is preserved, including class, method, and variable names. This is obviously a dream for hackers because we are usually working with complete gibberish. The names of classes, methods, and variables easily tell us exactly what the code is trying to do, and therefore it makes it a walk in the park to 
hack such things. What some smart developers do is they use a Unity plugin to mangle the names of all these entities, turning them into gibberish. Of course, we still see that they are there. We can also still see what they are doing. We just no longer have the added information of the name. The other form of protection that Unity developers use is a lot more obvious. We call them anti-cheats. Large multiplayer games like Rust or Escape from Tarkov employ kernel level anti-cheats. This is obviously expensive for the game company and let's not pretend that such anti-cheats are perfect because they aren't. These games still have massive cheating problems but at the very least it stops pasters and skids from easily hacking their games. The final way that Unity developers might protect their games is by encrypting certain metadata files. Earlier I mentioned that IL2CPP makes it harder to hack but the procedure also exports a ton of metadata that we can use to unobfuscate most of the code. One way to stop hackers from doing this is to encrypt said metadata files, effectively stopping hackers from revealing the important information. This is not that effective though, as at some point the game has to unencrypt the encrypted, and therefore if a hacker can find where or how that is happening, they can simply emulate the behavior to unencrypt the metadata. Not to mention, simply dumping the metadata at runtime once it's been unencrypted is another simpler option. Generally speaking, most Unity games use no countermeasures at all. I'm not really sure why, but I'm not complaining either. Of the games that are protected, the most common form is partial or full obfuscation. There are very few popular Unity games that are exported as IL2CPP with full obfuscation, encrypted metadata, and a kernel anti-cheat. And even those games still have hacking problems. When it comes to mono games, they are definitely the easiest and most fun to hack. While this video is not meant to be a tutorial, I'd still like to demonstrate just how simple it can be to hack these games. This is a game called Terratech, where you drive around as a tank and you can make your tank better by destroying others and stealing their blocks. Taking a look at this game on my disc, we find a mono bleeding edge folder, which indicates to us that this is, in fact, a mono game. I'm now going to direct you to this GitHub repository. It's an open source program called DNSpy. You can download it by either compiling the source code yourself or by heading to the releases tab and downloading the latest version for your platform. In my case, that's 64-bit Windows. Once you've downloaded the zip, I suggest you create a dnspy folder and extract the contents into there. You can now run dnspy.exe. In the top left, hover over file and select open. Navigate to your game's directory and then navigate into the folder postfixed with data. In my case, this is teratech64 underscore data. Then navigate to the manage folder and open up assembly c -sharp DLL. Just like that, it's almost like magic, you now have access to basically every single class, method and variable found in the game. You can then press Control shift k or hover over the Edit tab in the top left and select Search Assemblies in order to search through all these class, method and variable names. In my case, if I wanted to find the local player, I can simply search for player and we find a variable called underscore player tank. Double clicking on the result takes me to a class called singleton, which probably means that this is my local player being stored in a singleton instance. If I right click on a random method in this class and select edit method, I can now edit this function in any way I like before recompiling and having the changes take effect next time I run the game. I hope you can appreciate just how broken and easy this is. IL2CPP makes this process a little bit more difficult. If we take Bloons TD6 for example, opening the game up on our disk we find a Bloons TD6 underscore data folder, similar to a mono game but this time no mono bleeding edge folder. Within the data folder we find an IL2CPP underscore data folder which indicates to us that this game is of course using IL2CPP. Notice that we don't have any assembly C sharp DLL file to open in DNSpy though, but if you take a look at the metadata folder within the IL2CPP underscore data folder, you'll find a global metadata file which we can use to dump the C-sharp assembly from the game's binary files. I'm going to point you to this GitHub repository called IL2CPP Dumper. You can head to the releases tab and I suggest downloading the normal Windows version without .NET. Next, create an IL2CPP Dumper folder somewhere and extract the contents. Run IL2CPP Dumper and then navigate to your game's directory. The file it's looking for is the gameassembly.dll that should be found in the game's root directory. After you've selected that, give the dumper your global metadata file and let the magic happen. Within your IL2CPP dumper folder, you should now find a newly generated folder called dummy DLL. Within there, you should be able to find a dumped version of the game's assembly. You can now once again open assembly C sharp DLL in DNSpy and begin looking through the game. One important thing to understand now though is that you can still see the class and method names, but you can no longer see what these methods are doing. In order to do that, you need to open up game assembly DLL in a program like IDA Pro. Remember to re 
rebase the program to zero. Then if you take a look at the method in dnspy, you'll find something called RVA with an offset next to it. This is known as the relative virtual address. And if you navigate to this offset in IDA Pro, you'll find the accompanying assembly code for this function. Because remember, it was converted to C++ and then compiled. You can then rename it and decompile it to get an idea of what the function is doing. Furthermore, IL2CPP dumper will also generate Python scripts for IDA and Ghidra to basically rename your entire database with the correct method, structure and field names and sizes. And even on top of this, it will also generate an IL2CPP.h file that you can use in your hacks to mimic the game. In conclusion, Unity games are extremely easy to hack, and I hope I've proven that to you in this video. I also hope you have a better understanding of the Unity engine as a whole. It's a decent game engine, even if the company is incompetent. Before I go, I'd like to mention a special program called Melon Loader. The link will, of course, be in the description, but it's basically a universal mod loader for Unity games. It works with both Mono and IL2CPP as well. It has built-in IMGUI support and many more features that make developing mods, and by extension cheats, extremely extremely easy. It was simple in the first place, but now it's brain dead. Thanks for watching the video and I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to like and subscribe along with checking out my Patreon and other socials in the description down below. Leave a comment about what you thought and definitely look forward to more content in the future. Shout out to my sexy patrons and until next time, cheers and peace out.